excited that uh, several hundreds of people have registered to join us for the prototype showcase today. I want to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Patrick Diamond, the lead for the Global Surgical Training Challenge at MIT Solve. We are one of the partners on this challenge. And um, I want to welcome you all to this prototype showcase. You know, today is a major milestone for these 10 teams of innovators who are trying to transform the way that surgical training happens primarily in low and middle income countries. And today you'll hear from many of those teams through videos that they've prepared to, to basically demonstrate their work. And then also through an innovator panel, uh, you'll hear from some of the team members themselves. Before we get started, I wanna actually introduce and, and turn, yield the floor to Dr. Abebe Bekele. I was the Dean of School of Medicine at the University of Global Health Equity in uh, Rwanda, he's offered to kick us off with some opening remarks. Uh, I'll turn it over to you, Abebe, and um, then we'll get started. Everyone, and welcome to the prototype showcase for the Global uh, Surgical Training Challenge. Uh, my name is Abebe. I am the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic and Research Affairs at, and the Dean of School of Medicine at the University of Global Health Equity in Kigali, Rwanda. We're thrilled that you have joined us today to celebrate the transformational work of our challenge participants as they strive to shape the future of surgical training. Current surgical training programs, as you all know, rely heavily on access to patients in the operating theaters, in addition to, in addition to cadavers, live animals in wet labs, models, and expensive simulation-based training that's often inaccessible where resources are needed the most. This Global Surgical Training Challenge aims to address these inequities by changing the way surgical training is designed, delivered, and assessed. The challenge incentivizes the creation of low-cost surgical modules that are appropriate for learning in low- and middle-income countries and beyond. All of the modules include self-assessment frameworks that are designed not only to teach psychomotor skills, but also ensure the skill acquisition is, is appropriate in the environment the training is being undertaken. These surgical training modules you learn about today have been created by 10 Discovery Award teams. These teams are composed of multidisciplinary professionals such as clinicians, educators, designers, and engineers. And they are working in countries all over the world, in many cases across borders. In addition to their development work, the teams have been supported by an innovative mentorship program in partnership with the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, RCSI, and a virtual workshop series in partnership with MIT Solve. These teams are in the midst of building their prototype training modules, which will eventually be made freely available on, on an open source site. And all surgical practitioners globally will have access to use these modules in order to test and develop their surgical skills. I'm very excited to reintroduce you to the 10 Discovery Award teams today. And up next, you'll watch a short demonstration of the 10 training modules. You'll also hear from some of the innovators themselves during a brief panel discussion. On behalf of the organizers of the Global Surgical Training Challenge, Intuitive Foundation, Nesta Challenges, MIT Solve, the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, RCSI, and Apropedia. And my name, thank you for joining us today. And please keep safe. Thank you so much, Dr. Bakele. And uh, uh, we wish you the best for everything in Rwanda um, as well. Let's, uh, let's get started on uh, the video now and uh, we can hear from the teams themselves. So I'm excited for you to, uh, to hear. Trauma is the number one cause of death for men ages 15 to 45 in Guatemala. Hemorrhage is the leading cause of this death. Hi, I am Dr. Sabrina Asturias, the team lead for Crash Savers. Our team is diverse, with four trauma surgeons from Chile, two trauma surgeons from the US, and the rest of us are based in Guatemala. Dr. Reina is a virtual anatomy professor, and I am the chief of emergency surgery at Roosevelt Hospital. 
We all have experience teaching emergency surgery through simulation to medical and pre-hospital personnel. We identified that pre-hospital personnel do not recognize the correct indications for different hemorrhage control techniques. This leads to patients arriving at the hospital with preventable severe shock and the demand for blood products becomes overwhelming. The purpose of our project is to solve the need of a structured surgical training module for hemorrhage control directed to pre-hospital personnel, which will subsequently reduce the need for blood products. To acquire a surgical skill, the trainee must have a background of knowledge. Therefore, our module has instructions for installation of a virtual reality app that teaches the correct management for hemorrhage control. Additionally, the module contains a step-by-step -step manual to create a do-it-yourself low-cost simulator that will connect with the app, allowing the user to apply and self-assess these recently learned skills. The first step of our module is to install a virtual reality application where the user can access our clinical cases and educational material in either mobile mode or virtual reality. The app contains a series of case-based questions that evaluate the user's critical thinking on hemorrhage management. After answering the questions correctly, the trainee can proceed to practice on a physical model connected to the app. Our aim is that the trainee learns to distinguish between the different techniques of hemorrhage control and self-assess the skill of placing a tourniquet adequately and timely. Our Operpedia module will host all the resources necessary for users to install our app and build the simulator. Additionally, it contains a didactics and knowledge, practice skills, and self-assessment section. When the trainee wants to review a video of the adequate use of a tourniquet, he can do it by clicking on this link. The total building cost is of $94 and building time is around 15 to 20 hours. My name is Dr. Emmanuel Ame. I'm a professor of pediatric surgery and a chief consultant pediatric surgeon at the National Hospital in Abuja, Nigeria. Nearly 2 billion infants and children globally presently lack access to safe, affordable, and timely surgical care. The aim of our work is to make it possible for medical officers and general surgeons who are not specifically trained as pediatric surgeons to be able to provide the needed surgical care for this large number of children around the world. The model we are developing teaches learners on the preparation of a child for surgery, including the surgical decision-making process, gentle tissue handling skills, as well as post-operative care to ensure safe surgical outcome. We will use locally available supplies to create the simulated vessels that will teach the learners to avoid crushing the very delicate tissue of the neonate during hemostasis. Next, the trainees will have to suture the two wet ends of a cigarette together without damaging the wrap of the cigarette. Once there's very little damage to the cigarette wrap, it's very easy to see immediately that something has gone wrong. Once they are able to do that successfully, they can then handle the very delicate tissues of children, especially in creating neonatal colostomies, where the tissues involved are the most delicate. Using precisely calibrated forceps in forceps, we will collect data to verify that our simulation models are effective in training. We have previously tried live animals, but it required more time, it was messy, and it was obviously not something that the trainees could practice at their own time on a daily basis. It's important that the solution should be scalable and expandable to anywhere in the world without requiring any specialized equipment. It will teach gentle tissue handling skills that are transferable to other life-saving surgeries in newborns and children. We are working on making our open source training modules available on an ultra-portable, offline, energy-efficient Raspberry Pi with touchscreen display. This will provide self-assessed surgical training in rural settings for the 4 billion people with limited or no access to the internet. We are developing partnerships to deliver our offline training modules right across the entire Nigeria. We hope to deliver on demand to up to 33,000 general hospitals and 16 tertiary hospitals without access to a pediatric surgeon. Thank you so much for this exciting opportunity to make a difference to the lives of children around the world. Hello, my name is David Jeffcoach, and I am the program director of the General Surgery Residency at Soto Christian Hospital in Ethiopia. I am also the team lead of All Safe, African laparoscopic learners for safe advancement for ectopic pregnancy. 
Our team is a diverse group of surgeons, educators, and students from across the world working together and leveraging different expertise to create the most practical, effective, and impactful educational product that will change how surgery is learned and performed. Our goal is to create a platform that will help surgeons and surgery residents in resource-constrained areas learn how to perform laparoscopy safely without the presence of a teacher and without special equipment. Learners will access an open source web-based platform that will take them to a clinical case of a patient with an ectopic pregnancy. After learning the concepts of preoperative management through our interactive platform, learners can also develop the psychomotor skills needed to safely perform a laparoscopic salpingostomy using a low-cost box trainer and ectopic simulation they can easily build themselves. It can be built for less than 10 US dollars in about an hour. We have made this module accessible to learners as they will use one of the most common pieces of technology they have, their cell phones. To minimize barriers for our learners, the laparoscopic instruments are all commonly stock tools that can be borrowed from the hospital. The learners will watch a carefully curated video demonstra demonstration of an expert performing a laparoscopic salpingostomy in the box trainer. Using their cell phones as a simple laptop to relay the video, learners will practice a simulated procedure using the checklist as a stepwise guide. Once learners feel that they can perform all the items on the checklist, they'll use their phones to easily capture and upload their performance to our site. Because our philosophy is to support the development of surgeons' critical thinking and communication through feedback to peers, learners will be expected to provide feedback on other de-identified learners' performances using the provided checklist. Complementing this, learners will receive feedback from other participating learners. Using a scoring system, learners can evaluate their level of skill acquired through their practice. We are doing a pilot to, per to validate the scoring system currently. We envision future models to be on, to be on appendectomy, cholecystectomy, and bowel obstruction. The systems in the platform may not be high-tech or fancy, but the platform is usable and practical and gets to the heart of what is needed for us to teach laparoscopy here. My residents at SOTA have already been learning how to do laparoscopy on this platform. I truly believe that this project can revolutionize care here in Ethiopia and around the world. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dr. Priyanka Naidu and I'm the Regional Liaison for Team AmoSmile, a global collaboration of Operation Smile and AmoDisc surgeons, educators and technical experts with more than 40 years of combined experience in surgical education and the delivery of reconstructive surgery within resource constrained settings. Reconstructive surgery is essential for treating many common conditions like burns, trauma, cancer and congenital conditions, which each year are responsible for substantial morbidity and mortality. It is imperative that we train more surgical providers to address these common yet debilitating conditions. Sub-Saharan Africa is particularly impacted by these conditions, which account for 19% of all disability years and 22% of all deaths. It is vital that we develop an innovative yet resource conscious training platform that allows surgical trainees and practitioners to become independently confident and competent in performing foundational flap techniques like Z-plasty to reconstruct these conditions in low resource settings within sub-Saharan Africa and beyond. This showcase focuses on our mixed methods training platform using virtual and physical simulation to teach Z-plasty reconstruction in low resource settings. This local flap recruits tissue adjacent to the wound to release the scar, improve mobility and Reduce pain. We have developed a mobile app that guides learners through an entire curriculum, including step by step simulations and dynamic customized training with competency tracking. Our physical simulator is low cost, easily assembled, and entirely locally sourced, with the ability to simulate key steps of the procedure in a manner that is self directed, accessible, and clinically transparent. The AmoSmart app is intuitive and user friendly with effective tools and offline capabilities for self directed learning anywhere in the world. Learn about anatomy, indications, complications, and post op management. Integrated assessments throughout the module keep learners on track with their goals and learning objectives. The interactive simulator teaches every step of the Z-plasty relevant anatomy and clinical pearls and pitfalls. Questions on instrument selection and medical judgment are integrated to optimize translation to clinical practice. The app includes videos for the physical simulator, so everything you need is in one place, and you can advance the physical simulator once you've achieved competency. The simulator is constructed using a square wooden base with five screws positioned on opposing sides. Half a cardboard tube is then fixed to the wooden base to mimic natural body contour. The fabric square is then attached with the Plastic band. Their plastic and other flap designs can be drawn out and sized and manipulated so users can practice appropriate flap design angles, orientation, and reconstruction. Through repetitive reinforcement of psychomotor skills, users can directly translate their practical skills into improved competency and procedural ability in the operating room. Hello, I am Seno Saruni, a consultant general surgeon at Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital. I am Joanna Hunter Squires, a visiting lecturer at Moy University and a general surgeon at Indiana University. We are the team leaders for the AMPATH Surgical App, or ASAP. In support of the Global Surgical Training Challenge, 
We have been working with our team of expert educators, surgeons, engineers, and residents from both Moyen and Indiana to create a program to teach basic surgical skills. Our target learners are doctors who are expected to perform the World Health Organization essential surgical procedures, but may not have formal uh, surgical training. We surveyed Kenyan medical officers who identified the focus of our first module, the open appendectomy. They believed self-directed training on the basic surgical skills for this procedure would provide safer outcomes of, for their patients. Our open appendectomy module is focused on guiding the learner through the cognitive, psychomotor, and judgment skills necessary to diagnose appendicitis, complete the procedure safely, and care for the patient postoperatively. We have elected to have our learner create the model, not only to reinforce his knowledge on surgical anatomy, but also to practice basic surgical techniques, including suturing, instrument tying, and suture ligating. The learner can find all the necessary materials locally at a fraction of the cost of a traditional simulation model. After building the model, the learner will practice the open appendectomy procedure in its entirety. The learner will review the cognitive task analysis algorithm that was created through expert consensus. This algorithm provides more detail and technique in cognitive decision making than a surgical atlas alone. To receive feedback, the learner will record herself with her cell phone camera as she completes basic surgical skills to create her model and perform the open appendectomy. The videos will be uploaded and then assessed by artificial intelligence. It will provide the learner with specific feedback based on individual steps of the procedure. ASAP open appendectomy provides our learners who currently have no simulation resources or limited technical training with a way to practice basic surgical skills and receive feedback. This innovative approach of a self-made model allows the learner to become familiar with the anatomy. Through this learning module, we hope our learners become more proficient and comfortable with their surgical skills in the life-saving open appendectomy procedure. Thank you. Well, welcome uh, to the Innovator Panel as part of the Global Surgical Training Challenge Prototype Showcase. I'm joined by four uh, of the team members from uh, 10 of the Discovery Award teams to talk a little bit about uh, some of the reasons that we've designed this challenge the way we have and, and what that means for the innovation that's happening on the ground. So I'd love to give a chance, uh, kind of yield the floor to the four um, team members here to introduce themselves. Yeah, so hi, I'm Vikas. Uh, I'm the CEO founder of the startup company AlgoSearch. It's a medtech startup. And uh, here we are, uh, here I am a team lead of a project called Open Surgery Sim, which is a sur surgical training module for bone deformity correction, complex bone deformity correction. Thank you. Welcome, Vikas. Um, Ramesh. Yeah, I'm Makam Ramesh from Bangalore, India. And I'm the director of Bangalore Endoscopic Surgery Training Institute and Research Center. Uh, this is an institute that I founded uh, 25 years ago to teach surgeons laparoscopic surgeries. And uh, they, I have uh, been uh, training a lot of surgeons across. And now I've taken up this project called Intellivision. Uh, from which we want to develop a training program to teach surgeons how to do laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Thank you very much. Uh, Colleen? Hello, I'm Colleen Sabatini. I am a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. I'm based um, in Oakland, California, where I work for the University of California, San Francisco. And for the last six years, I have been doing a lot of work in Uganda, uh, where um, I have the great honor and privilege of working with some really phenomenal orthopedic surgeons there, um, including my co-lead for Team Italo, uh, Dr. Moses Muhumuza Fisha. Italo is um, a project that is focused on teaching the psychomotor skill of drilling bone for the purpose of advancing um, treatment of open fractures and osteomyelitis in resource limited areas to make sure that people get the acute treatment that they need to avoid long term complications and disability. Um, so it's an honor to be with everybody today. Thank you. Thank you. And Kier? Thanks, Patrick. I'm Kier Thielander, uh, Executive Vice President for uh, an organization called PAX, Pan African Academy of Christian Surgeons. We do surgical training and discipleship throughout Sub Saharan Africa and have a site in Egypt as well. I've uh, been doing this 
our organization is about 25 years old. I've been in this role for about five years now, previously lived in Gabon for 10 years, west coast of Africa. And uh, our project is called All Safe. And it's looking at um, really addressing one of the issues. There's a lot of laparoscopic equipment sitting dormant in much of sub-Saharan Africa. It's been purchased, but not utilized. And so how do we get basic laparoscopic surgical skills uh, training to happen uh, throughout the, the sub-Saharan Africa region? All right. Well, thank you and, and welcome uh, panelists. Uh, so what we're gonna do for the next uh, 20 minutes is really give the audience a better sense uh, for why we launched this challenge and uh, some of the decisions that were made in the design of the challenge and what that means for these teams that are um, interpreting them and innovating and using them uh, to design new ways of training surgical practitioners in resource constrained settings. So I'm gonna ask uh, the panelists a bunch of different questions to give the audience a better sense of what this challenge is all about. Um, and uh, then we'll hear, we'll get back to some of the presentations from the teams, uh, the other teams as well. Um, so with that, I'd like to pose the question, you know, why has this challenge focused on self-assessment? Why is that such a key fundamental aspect of this challenge? And, and what does that mean for, for your teams? A big part of this challenge, right, is teaching surgical skills um, in places where people don't necessarily have immediate resources, um, including teachers, um, including mentors. And so a, a big part of this is being able to produce a teaching module that then somebody can take on their own um, and get the resources to build their simulator from local supplies and resources. Um, and to watch online the online video content that we've developed, the online educational resources we've developed and to do that on their own in whatever their learning environment is at their home, in their hospital. Um, and the self-assessment part is critical be, be, because we're assuming they don't have somebody around them that is teaching them this skill. We are teaching them this skill through our work, through um, our Apropedia pages and, and the work that we've done through this challenge. And so um, they need a way to understand if they're learning this skill correctly. And so for us, we have done, um, our self-assessment includes a series of rubrics where we've defined different aspects of surgical skills that are necessary to carry out bone drilling um, in the different ways that we are trying to teach it um, and developing um, sort of a, ways for them to look and see am I doing this well? So if I'm trying to enter this bone and I slip, um, am I slipping all the time before I engage the cortex or am I you know, only slipping half the time? And we should be seeing them get better over time. And we've written that out for them so that they can see that they are improving. We all know that you wanna, like all of us wanna know that we're doing something well um, and have clear goals for how to get there. Um, and I think that's where the self-assessment comes in. Very clear um, sort of rubrics of, of how to get from point A to point B in terms of developing their skill um, and in a way to determine if they're doing that well. Um, with that, I'd like to ask another question uh, to the other panelists about um, how, you know, how can low tech technologies be just as uh, innovative or impactful as high tech? And I use those terms somewhat hesitantly because low and high has a hierarchical element to it. But in terms of you know, defining my terms, low tech meaning generally more accessible uh, materials or approaches uh, that, uh, don't, that are, uh, tend to be more affordable as well. Uh, and higher tech being you know, more digital and, and, um, and uh, technologies that typically have a higher cost. So with that in mind, you know, I'd be curious to hear how low tech can be just as innovative and, and impactful as, as a tool in learning. Um, and with that, I would love to hear from, from Kier first. Uh, I think there's some uh, significant uh, components to both the high tech and low tech approaches that are applicable in both directions. It's really a two way street that we haven't completely realized yet. And this, the, this global surgical training challenge has allowed an opportunity to look at that low tech side and see how can we really develop something that is adequate and even better than adequate in terms of teaching 
and that requires that that low tech be applicable to the setting. It can't just be something that you've you've decided, oh, let's make it low tech for no reason, and we haven't even really applied it to the situation. So there's a value in that low tech in its expandability because it's not as complex. So often we think of high tech being more complex, and it usually is. And that high tech complexity, how much more benefit does it bring us because of the high tech complexity? Very small amount compared to the major impact of one low tech advancement can get you to this point in terms of understanding and performing a skill. And that last little high tech complexity might get you this much more. And so the bang for buck in one sense is huge with low tech innovation and the opportunity to implement that in innovation is much broader than something that's co complex and high tech. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Colleen, I know we had discussed this a little bit before, but in terms of high and low tech, you also mentioned that um, there's, there's a, a key element of how the instructions are written uh, and that can contribute to success in using uh, low, low tech technologies. I would love to hear your perspective on on how uh, learning materials are, are complementary to the tools that are being used. Yeah, uh, I, well, I think that, um, you know, we, we are all sort of multimodality learners at this point, right? We, we are accustomed to taking information in uh, from, from visuals. Um, so seeing pictures, watching videos from, you know, reading, um, whether that be, you know, background knowledge about certain uh, surgical conditions or actual surgical technique. Um, and I think we, and I'm sure all of the teams have um, sought to provide educational information and surgical instruction in those different uh, modalities. And so, um, you know, we have developed both didactic, you know, sort of PowerPoint like um, lectures that somebody can go through um, and learn the background information that, that they need to see step by step parts of surgical procedures. Um, in order to treat their patients. Uh, we have developed, um, you know, computer-aided design videos um, to be able to show people sort of the basics of what we're talking about, because we are trying to teach non-orthopedic surgeons how to take care of, of bone problems. Um, and so these are people who have not had orthopedic residency training. So we need to provide the necessary background information so that they can um, take care of these problems safely and confidently. Um, and so we do that through providing these various forms of educational information, videos that they can watch, lectures that they can go through. Um, and then again, the self-assessment of those things to make sure that they are acquiring the knowledge and skills that they need to be able to safely perform um, these procedures. So today, uh, this is the prototype showcase and each of the 10 teams that have been um, awarded funding to build prototypes are indeed building prototypes. So this is a, a work in progress. Um, with that in mind, I'd love to shift our, our, our focus a bit to the process that each of the teams has been using to test uh, these, these approaches, which are novel and new and, and quite innovative. Um, so I would love to hear from, from you, Vikas, to start, how has your team considered the user and more importantly, their environment uh, as important features, important factors in uh, skill acquisition uh, for, for your target procedure? Yeah, so, you know, the best way to, you know, factor in user environment and user in the product is any product is uh, to not just to test with users, but also to build with users. So that's why every team here has a surgeon in their team, right? And have some clinical facility where we can go and build it. So, uh, uh, but for that, yes, uh, the, the first mo most important thing is whether there's a good communication between the surgeons and the uh, uh, engineers who are building it. You know? So for that, we have been working like for many years before, and that's why we can very efficiently communicate and make the product. So, so, so surgeons understand some of the engineering language. We readily understand a lot of clinical uh, stuff. So, and that is the most important thing when you want to work with users like surgeons. So uh, uh, from day one, we have made a facility in uh, uh, the surgeon's clinic and started building everything there 
uh, not just expert surgeons, but this is actually not for expert surgeons, this is actually for the trainees. So we have also incorporated some, included some trainees to give us feedback while we are building the product. So I think that that's the best uh, uh, process if you want to get user and you, their environment factored in, in, in your product, uh, like in the surgical module, then you have to work with them in their place. So we build the whole thing in the hospital. And then we had the surgeons in one group who are experts in doing laparoscopic surgeries. Then we had uh, uh, paramedical staff who are nurses and other OR staff who we considered as an intermediate group. And then we had and the rest of the people as one more group who have never seen a laparoscopy or done laparoscopic surgery. And then every time we built a training module, uh, we tried to look at building an assessment module. And while uh, for the assessment module, we made all of them work on that. So we had a scores uh, of three sets of people and then we gave all this to our artificial intelligence uh, algorithm guy, and he tried to look at what is it that's different between an expert surgeon and a layperson and an OR staff who knows something about it. So they tried to evaluate them and then see what actually is making the difference and then develop the assessment module. And I think that worked wonderfully well for us. Yeah, I would just add that um, another thing for us is just the recognition that, you know, one of the main goals of this is to keep it low tech and very accessible. Um, and that ideally the simulator um, can be built, you know, by anybody anywhere in the world. So one of the things that we have tried to do is to not make like a very scripted simulator, but instead to develop sort of a matrix of options. So for us, for example, it's a multi-layer um, uh, extremity um, simulator, uh, but bone being the fundamental you know, piece that we're using to teach. Um, but in our simulator, that bone can be a, a, an actual animal bone. So if somebody can go to their local, local butcher and you know, get cow or goat or pig bone, um, it can be a PVC pipe, it can be bamboo, it can be um, a Play-Doh cylinder cooked, um, you know, either in a in a stove or or in the hot sun. Um, and so we have tried to identify multiple different options for each of the of the layers, so that regardless of where somebody is, regardless of their budget for this, they will have accessible options uh, for which to build a simulator. Um, Thank you. That actually leads to my next question, which is about what it means in practice uh, for each of your teams to uh, create truly accessible and reproducible modules. We just heard, you know, one approach is to have a, a number of substitutable um, uh, materials to get the same effect or, or a similar effect. I would love to hear, um, you know, other teams approaches to ensuring that their trainings are uh, accessible and reproducible um, as, as in many different environments. Maybe we could start with you, Kier, and then uh, I'd love to hear from others too. Yeah, happy to share a bit about how we've, we've navigated that. So we have the luxury of having 10 different sites in eight different countries, and three of those sites are involved with this project. Uh, and so that means we have input from Kenya, from Ethiopia, and from Cameroon. And so one way is to say what materials are available in all three of those different areas of Sub-Saharan Africa. So finding something that is commonly available as opposed to finding multiple options, both are great solutions, uh, but that's the way we've overcome that is to say what materials are available in all of these locations that can then be used. And it could, if those are the materials that are being used, then it would be accessible to everyone throughout uh, really Sub-Saharan Africa they could reproduce then this training module in a very straightforward manner. Also making sure that it's uh, the, the instructions are clear for multiple pers perspectives of interpreting that. There's language barriers uh, that are potential and how do we overcome those language barriers? Uh, there's other challenges in terms of material acquisition and then cost. So how do we keep it low cost? Uh, the important factor is when you talk about reproducibility, it's not only about that you are able to assemble it and see it in the same form everywhere. It should perform 
uh, the same way everywhere. So when it, it comes about, I'm talking about robustness. In engineering, of course, reproducibility is mean meaning robustness. But so how we ensure that is we have to make some processes or some protocols to test the training system itself. I would look at accessibility and reproducibility in uh, two different ways. One is the materials and the way we build it. It should be very easy and with very basic equipment and very basic facilities, people should be able to do it. Uh, and at the same time, I don't think we should be looking at uh, not having a little more high tech. If it makes value, we have to have high tech, but then try to bring down the cost. Thank you all. So I'd like to wrap up this panel by asking you all the same questions and hearing a, a short reply. But there are people watching this event today who are probably inspired by the work that each of you are doing and your teams are doing. Um, do you have a piece of advice to people who are just getting started in this world of creating uh, low cost, affordable, and truly accessible training modules for surgical practitioners? Um, if something comes to mind, we'd, I'm sure they would love to hear your advice for, for how to get started. Uh, we can start with you, Vikas. Yeah, so since I come from startup ecosystem, you know, I, I believe that anything you want to make uh, something innovative out of the box. Uh, the most important is the team. So if you want to make something, if you intend to make something, first form a great team. And forming this multidisciplinary team of engineers and surgeons is not an easy job. Uh, I'm sure that most of the teams who are working with engineers, they have been prior, you know, already working for years together. That's why they have very efficient communication and uh, uh, they are building amazing stuff. So. Forming a team would be most important. Thank you. Others? Here? I think Vikas took what I was going to say, but I would just build on that, that uh, some of the importance in forming that team is the multinational aspect of it. If we really want something that is going to be expandable and impact greater than just one country, we shouldn't make an assumption that a team that is very homogenous is going to be able to do that. So the 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 multinational, multi whatever lingual as well aspect of the team is extremely important in cultural perspectives as well, because it can bring in other factors that you may not be aware of if you're just in your one little group and you all look the same and you all think the same. One thing we have to realize is we are a global family now. We're not sitting at home and saying we have a small family. Uh, one very good thing that happened to me is the mentorship. Uh, so there are times when we, we've done a lot of research, development, everything, gone through uh, hiccups, we've gone into thought blocks, we didn't know how to go forward. And then you, are, you know that you're not alone. You've got people to help you out and they cruise you through whatever problems you have. And that's one of the biggest things that we have here. And the second thing is there is there are workshops where we're actually looking at how the other people are thinking and how they are trying to plan things. So there are sometimes there is a lot of exchange of thoughts, exchange of uh, information that really helps us. Uh, as far as our own team, I, I felt that the communication is extremely important. I have somebody who's doing 3D modeling and animation. I have got somebody who's editing my videos. I've got somebody who's building a module, some engineers doing on electronics, somebody on software. And then each one of us think the other guy is an idiot because I can't, the, he cannot understand my language. So there's a whole bit of challenges there, but then only communication and communication happening very often can really, really make things. I think one thing to acknowledge for this that, that maybe hasn't been called out specifically is sort of the education-oriented self-assessment experts who are really critical for this as well. Like I, as a surgeon, know how to teach surgery in a certain way, uh, but when you're talking about you know, teaching it in, in the, the way that the challenge has asked us to, where it's self-directed self learning and self-assessment, um, you know, I, I needed the the wonderful, you know, input of our colleague, Taylor, Taylor Colton, 
who is um, our education person for Team Italo and has been, you know, a critical force in helping us develop our rubrics and our tools for self-assessment. And um, the surgeons and the engineers could not have done that um, without that person. So I think my advice is to really say, what are we trying to accomplish here? And who are the right people to have at the table? Um, and to, as surgeons, be humble that we don't necessarily know all the answers to the questions, even if we're teaching something surgical. Um, and that for the non-clinical people, that having the clinical people involved is critical as well, right? So the, the project will not be successful um, without all the right folks participating in that conversation and for everybody to actually be listening to one another and really trying to hear what other people are saying and learn from one another and recognize that um, that that team collective group of knowledge is going to be critical to develop something successful. Um, so I would uh, I would add that to sort of that framework. My name is Muhumuza Moses Fisher, an orthopedic surgeon at Kosu Hospital in Uganda and co-team lead of the Italo project. Italo stands for Education to Advance Limb Saving Options for Osteomyelitis and Open Fractures. Our multidisciplinary team's goal is to improve treatment of open fractures and osteomyelitis, which are sources of significant surgical burden and disability globally. In many resource-limited settings, there is insufficient access to surgical care and a lack of orthopedic surgeons. So often, medical officers and general surgeons are the first line of defense in treating patients with limb-threatening conditions. Drilling bone is a necessary skill for the management of fractures and infection. When medical providers who don't have the basic orthopedic training are confronted with such patients in their district or rural hospitals, they are not often comfortable in providing the necessary care. Our Italo bone drilling simulator model attempts to solve this gap in training, competence, and confidence. The main audience for our innovative drill down curriculum is medical students, medical officers working in the community, and general surgeons in areas without the available orthopedic surgeon. Our simulator is a layered model built with locally available and affordable materials. We offer instruction on both simple and advanced simulators and we developed a matrix of material options for each of the layers that the learner can reference to when building their own simulator. One of the key components to our simulator is the plunge detector that alerts the learner if they have plunged too far into the soft tissues. We believe that the range of simulator options can be used for learners to practice and self-assess the mechanics of bone drilling with the eventual goal of performing this task successfully on humans. Our training video course includes simple background instructional materials, educational videos that explain the necessary information and skills and step-by-step -step instructions on building and using the simulator to learn the psychomotor skill of drilling bone. Having more practitioners in low middle income countries trained in bone drilling skills will result in more timely and improved better outcomes for the patients and less disability around the world. I'm Dr. Markham Ramesh, Director of Bangalore Endoscopic Surgery Training Institute and Research Center. In support of the Global Surgical Training Challenge, I'm working with my team to develop a self-training and assessment module to teach the laparoscopic cholecystectomy procedure. I have in my team Dr. Tulip, Vijay Ashwant, Rajshekar Reddy, Srujan Jiyal, Dr. Santosh Kumar, Sanchit Sharma, Sudhira Shetty, Bijli Woman, and two young engineers, Chandan and Karthik. With extensive domain expertise in laparoscopic surgical training and proficiency in all other knowledge domains, we are ideally poised for creating these training modules. Laparoscopic cholecystectomy is one of the most common operations performed by surgeons. It is the first kind of laparoscopic surgery that novice surgeons learn, which paves the way for learning and performing several other surgeries. We have designed three modules that help in complete and holistic training. The first module aims to contribute understanding and awareness of the procedure. This module helps to acquire broad knowledge about performing safe surgery, managing complications and teamwork. The second is to instill cognitive and decision-making skills through an interactive mobile application. 
An assessment module helps score the training based on instrument selection, surgical steps, and decision making in complex situations. Our third module, which entails a complete surgical simulator, aims to teach psychomotor skills. It is a simple endo trainer designed to perform various tasks and master task-based exercises. The innovation here lies in accessible smartphone-based AR headset. The trainee observes the endoscope feed through this headset and is guided through surgery videos and real-time performance feedback. The trainee first masters task-based exercises and finally graduates on to cholecystectomy, which they perform on a synthetic organ. At the end of the procedure, a robust AI model compares the trainee's performance to an expert's and score them on various metrics. Our training modules provide step-by-step -step training, cognitive and surgical psychomotor skills. With real-time guidance and skill assessment incorporated, it offers expert training on an affordable budget and a do-it-yourself manual. I'm Marissa Sipasod, a pediatric general surgeon from Georgetown, Guyana. Our team, Set Every Little Heart Free by Training, or self-training, is composed of a diverse and talented group of professionals experienced in clinical medicine, surgery, medical education, and biomedical technology. Many of us have long been involved in helping surgeons develop the skills required to build surgical capacity, especially in low- and middle-income countries. This background provides us the insight and gives us experience in the setting in which our prototype will be used. Our module is surgical closure of the patent ductus arteriosus. We have chosen this procedure because greater than 90% of the world's pediatric heart disease patients do not have access to cardiac surgeons. PDA closure can be efficiently addressed and resolved by properly trained general surgeons without the use of complex devices. Annually, this procedure may save the lives of thousands of children, especially premature babies in low- and middle-income countries. Our simulator involves a surgical box, a physical model of a PDA, a sensor, and an interactive 3D augmented reality app-based overlay. The dimensions of the surgical box aim to mimic the chest cavity and therefore the position that the surgeon's hands and body will take during surgery. By providing the anatomical references through the physical model in combination with AR, our simulator will enable the surgeon to identify the PDA and avoid the damage of other critical anatomical structures. We are working on a homemade lifelike material for the physical model using gelatin and meat glue that can be made in anybody's kitchen. In exploring various methods of psychomotor feedback, we have developed a toolkit of sensors. To build a simulator, the first step is to assemble the surgical box from laser cut wooden panels. The self-made physical model is then held in position using two lollipop sticks attached to a wooden frame which will sit on top of the sensor inside the surgical box. Our simulator will cost 50 US dollars, including all of the surgical instruments, sensors, models, anatomical structures, and the AR smartphone app. Another key advantage is that we can expand this low cost generic sensing platform to monitor a wide range of physical and mechanical feedback, including electrical resistance, magnetic, ultrasonic, capacitance, and infrared signals. Currently, we have not been able to find another prototype similar to the one we have developed. Today, most surgeons try to do their first PDA closure in a living human body after assisting senior surgeons for some time. We believe this simulator will provide surgical trainees and general surgeons with the skills needed to perform PDA closure safely and effectively, saving many lives in low- and middle-income countries. My name is Dr. Habila Omaru, and I am the team lead for the Tibia Fracture Fixation Project. For the Global Surgical Training Challenge, I have been working with international team of clinicians, creative technologists, and educators to build a training module to allow medical officers and surgeons who are not orthopedic specialists to perform bicortical drilling as part of dynamic compression plate fixation procedures for tibial fractures performed in regions without specialist coverage. In Nigeria, the shortage of orthopedic surgeons leaves patients vulnerable to traditional bone setters whose unsafe practices commonly lead to gangrene, limb loss, and death. Our module provides high-fidelity 3D printed bone simulation models 
to teach learners biocritical drilling skills. Open source 3D printing technology supports the local manufacturing of the highest fidelity bone simulation model at the lowest cost in low to middle income countries for medical officers and surgeons who are not orthopedic specialists. All of the modules, bone simulation models are open source, can be made on open source, open filament desktop 3D printers using biorenewable plastic and are designed to be ready for use right out of the 3D printer. The modules accurately simulate bone length and diameter, external contour, cross-sectional shape, biquartical anatomy, cortical hardness, cancellous bone porosity, and microstructure and far cortex thickness for both genders at tibial shaft drilling site for plate fixation. The learner will listen to audio file while viewing graphics to learn to identify the sound changes during biquartical drilling. The module's self-assessment framework for biquartical drilling includes recording plunge depth and time trials in the downloadable open source Excel-based training logbook. This will be translated into the six official languages of the United Nations. Our surgical training model will teach drilling skills that are transferable to the performance of other limb-saving orthopedic surgeries that require implant stabilization and fixation. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, I'm Vikas. I'm the founder of a startup company, AlgoSearch, and team lead of Open Surge Sim project. My team also includes my co-founder Amit Moria and clinical experts like Dr. Manish Agrawal and Dr. Mangal Parihar who are very senior orthopedic surgeons of the country and expert trainers in the field of deformity correction. It is estimated that more than 30% of total number of bone deformity correction surgeries need to undergo revision. This is due to the lack of expert surgeons. And that's why we created Open Surge Sim. It's a cloud-based software to train any junior or trainee orthopedic surgeon to gain expertise in bone deformity correction surgeries. Open Surge Sim can be accessed through Apropedia. A trainee will learn the basic principles of deformity corrections through reading material available at Apropedia. The trainee first uses the planning module of the software to learn planning of deformity correction surgeries on digital X-ray images, which are available in the software as various case studies. The trainee will learn to plan a surgery case by following the step-by-step -step guidance from a previously created surgery plan by an expert surgeon. There will also be non-guided training cases where the trainee does the entire planning but without the benefit of the guidance. At every critical step in the planning, the software questions the trainee to assess the performance for that particular step and finally makes up overall score for each planned case. The final and the most important part of the training is the psychomotor training. For this, the trainee uses a web camera few clamps and fixtures, basic tools for drilling and cutting the bone models as well as an external fixator implant. The bone models will be assembled using the parts from a modular bone kit. The trainee then follows the instructions given by the software to perform various steps of the surgery. The webcam of the training setup captures the training process and the software tracks the bones and tools. This object tracking is used to measure the errors in various steps like drilling, cutting, and final corrections to calculate the final score for each case. To help the training to methodologically improve the training pathway, the overall assessment scores are presented in various forms. We believe that Open Surge Sim will help many trainee surgeons to gain expertise in complex bone deformity corrections without a need of an expert trainer and even at low resource settings. Thank you very much. What an amazing overview of the 10 Discovery Award teams for the Global Surgical Training Challenge. We are all virtual, so we can't give them a round of applause, but if we were together, we would do so. Big congratulations to all those 10 teams who have been working throughout the pandemic and over the last several months to build and uh, build those prototype training modules and share them all with you today. I wanna thank each of the teams for doing so, as well as to Dr. Bakele for kicking off this event. You know, this challenge is, um, we're here today to show you more about uh, the, the work that these teams have been doing, but this is just the beginning. In the chat, I have shared a link to what's known as an Apropedia page, which is the, the site where each of the team's work is actually housed and now publicly available 
for you all to read in greater detail. So I invite you all to look at those pages to read more about them. And you'll certainly hear from us in the future about ways to collaborate with those teams and with the challenge as well. So on behalf of the entire organizing team behind the Global Surgical Training Challenge, I wanna thank you all for joining us for this prototype showcase. The organizers of this challenge include the main funder, the Intuitive Foundation, Nesta Challenges, MIT Solve, the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, and Apropedia Foundation. I'm Patrick Diamond from MIT Solve, and I wanna thank you all again for participating today. And we look forward to being in touch with you afterwards about the progress uh, that will happen over the next few months. Thank you and have a great day.